And now we will go to Kenyatta, uh, conversations with Kenyatta. And uh, toward the end of that, Elijah will open that up to questions and answers. Um, Kenyatta, good to have you back. Thank you. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Uh, okay, great. Hey, Kenyatta, can you? I can hear you, but feedback. <laughs> okay, great. Let's see. Can you hear me okay now with no feedback? Yes, this is good. Okay, great. So I think, uh, yes, yeah, so my speaker. Okay, so I think we're good. Yep, yep. Awesome. Well, I, I'm i really excited for our conversation, Kenyatta, I have to say. So I had an opportunity to watch um, an episode of Genealogy Roadshow as I was preparing. Uh, for our conversation today. And literally it only took one episode for me to come up with all these questions um, and just get really, really excited um, based on the, the things that I saw you and your colleagues doing. Um, first, I'll give you a very brief introduction, which probably won't even speak to all the accomplishments that you have, but just to sort of provide some perspective to our audience members from where you're coming from. I understand that you are an author, uh, an attorney, and obviously a genealogist. Uh, you host PBL along with some of your colleagues. PBS's Genealogy Roadshow television series, which comes on. Uh, and then also you are a contributor to the New York Times 1619 project. Um, so I'm very honored to even just be speaking with you today and, and very happy to um, hopefully get a chance to shed some light on, um, on some things that I'll get into here. So uh, I think it's fair to say that we are sort of entering a new era of racial reckoning in our country where the 1619 project, the New York Times, businesses, colleges um, and different institutions are starting to appreciate and acknowledge how slavery and race have shaped America's history and institutions and continues to do so. Uh, as I'm sure you know, um, federal government, uh, President Biden and Congress uh, made Juneteenth a federal holiday, uh, which I'm very excited about, which I think just sort of speaks to this moment that we're in of acknowledging the role of slavery um, in our country's history. And so what I'd like to talk to you about today is the role that genealogy can sort of play in this historical moment that we're having. Um, I had an opportunity to send you some of our interview questions beforehand. I don't know if you had an opportunity to look at them, but I tried to give you some fair warning. So I'm gonna say they're fair game. Okay. So my first question to you, Kenyatta, is uh, why do you think that genealogy is particularly important to African-Americans? Um, and what do you think it can sort of help us learn about the African-American experience? So I think genealogy is important to you after, are you getting feedback from me? No. By any chance? Okay, perfect. Um, so I think genealogy is important to African-Americans um, because it connects us with the past. As I talked earlier about trying to find your enslaved ancestors, right? A lot of times as we've seen throughout the day that sometimes you have these connections to different uh, pieces of history that are not necessarily uh, things that you may be proud of. Um, but when you find these ancestors and you give them voices, then it gives you a sense of pride. And I feel like studying your family history and your genealogy helps you learn more about the African-American experience that has been covered up, that hasn't been told. Those mm -hmm. stories that people don't want you to know about, you know, they don't want you to know about the, the, the lynchings, they don't want you to know about the segregation that went on, or they don't want you to know about the terror that, Black men endured in trying to place their vote, you know, at the ballot box in 1867. So mm -hmm. I think by studying this stuff, it helps us really understand history and definitely understand American history. You have preempted about three or four of my next questions. So <laughs> I'm so glad that you were able to sort of pick up on those little themes. And I'd like to sort of drill down on each of them sure. in sort of our, our um, continuing conversation. Um, my next question is, um, and, and you sort of mentioned this um, just in terms of the results of the genealogy study and sort of what it reveals about our history. And sometimes it can sort of be more disappointing um, or um, even depressing uh, when you sort of figure out the extent of the trauma that mm -hmm. African-American families faced um, and our ancestors sort of had to go through as, as the genealogy studies reveal. Um, so my question is, how do you think the results and reactions from genealogical studies can affect African-Americans 
in different ways than our white counterparts. And I was just thinking of a few examples based on that one episode of Geneo Genealogy Roadshow that I saw. And it was like one um, white lady who came on found that her ancestors might have come over on the Mayflower or something. And I'm like, okay, well, our ancestors probably, you know, for us, it would be like our ancestors were chartered on this particular slave ship, right? Or right. finding out that you might be related to Thomas Jefferson, maybe if you're a white person, but then for an African-American person, it could be like, you know, finding out that your ancestors were enslaved by Thomas Jefferson. So how do you think that sort of dynamic goes and how do you think it can be different? So I think the results, there's a lot in that question, but the results are definitely, uh, it's definitely different. I mean, I, I believe the episode you're talking about is Austin, um, probably, I think, if it's the woman that had four, because I, if, I if I recall, I think she had four connections to the Mayflower. One of the things about having that connection um, that's different is you can say, well, I know the point of entry for my ancestor at this point in time. That's difficult for us to say, right? I mean, I've been doing this for over 20 years. I can't necessarily say that, you know, my, you know, Mildred or Martha was on this particular slave ship, right? Or whoever came from Africa. I can't, I have not identified that yet. So I think it's the experience. Um, and I think Nicole Hannah-Jones, who was the architect or is the architect of the 1619 Project, talked about this when we're in Detroit and that for her, it was a day in school where you had to sort of kind of pinpoint on the map where your family was from. And she couldn't do that. And so that's the difference, right? We get the DNA test that says I'm 40, you know, my, my book says, I think I'm like 44% um, or something, Ivory Coast, Ghana or something like that. And then, but yet my DNA results from ancestry changed to now I'm 42% Nigerian, right? Mm -hmm. So I really, so I think the difference in finding these results is that you have this, you have a connection to a certain place is one. I'm not saying we can't do that, but I think that's one of the differences. The other is from a psychological perspective, which I talked about this on my podcast, is the trauma that we have, the generational trauma of, of, of being enslaved and having enslaved ancestors and finding, as I showed earlier with Mary um, and George, on a inventory with a value attached to them. That's your relative. That's your blood. Like, if that's going to impact you, that's going to have some psychological impacts. You're going to need to sit with that. Mm -hmm. So when we start doing our genealogy research, I think the quest for us is more or less around, you know, we want to find our people, right? And it's not necessarily, I want to be related to someone famous. I just want to be able to find them post-slavery or find them during slavery. So mm -hmm. I think that's kind of um, the, the big difference that I see and the differences that I saw on the show. Yeah, the stories we did on the show. You spoke about trauma and it's almost, um, it's unfortunate because I feel like there's trauma whether you know your roots or whether you don't. Um, if you don't, so I, the example I have, my wife, um, her maiden name is Handberry, H-A-N-D-B-E-R-R-Y. And okay. she was at work one day and one of her white colleagues asked, you know, was like, I guess, you know, I'm Irish, German, whatever. Where are you from or where does your family come from? And she was like, I don't know, sir, like my ancestors were enslaved and this name, this surname was given to me, right? But that was sort of, I won't call it a microaggression, but just sort of a, a tiny instance of trauma that she as an African-American woman had to endure that obviously our white counterparts really aren't faced with. But then, and, and she has not, I don't think, done sort of an extensive ancestry um, sort of background to figure out where her, her, her white enslavers came from. Uh, but then if you do know your genealogy, your genealogical history, like you said, there's still trauma because you figure out, you know, you see maybe your great, great aunt or great, you know, great grandfather sort of listed with a, um, a value next to him, right? Like a chattel. Um, or maybe you're in a Hannah Valentine situation and, you know, you see that your uh, great, great grandmother was separated from your great, great grandfather or something. And you, you find that your family was sold down the river or sold to sort of, um, you know, the deep south. So I almost feel like it's a it's a catch 22, right? Whether you whether you know your history or whether you don't, there's still going to be some trauma in there. Yeah, there is. But there's also some um, resilience in there. Right. There's also the the as I think you mentioned earlier, you know, knowing what our an our ancestors went through 
and their survival to get us here to have this conversation and us talking about them and bringing these things up. Because when you do the research is when you find the information. If we want to keep things in the past or brush them off or anything like that, then we're not necessarily allowing ourselves or these folks to have their stories being told. So while there is trauma, I think with that trauma, there does come some resilience. And what we're looking for is not necessarily a society, right? Because a big thing in doing genealogy, at least in the past, was a connection to a society, a lineage society, right? Mayflower, DAR, whatever. What we're looking for is a connection to, to this person, a connection to sort of a connection to Africa, like a connection to our homeland. And the more we do the research, the more we can kind of get back and, and get into that connection. And even if we can't find it, like I haven't found it for my family, but I still know that there's one there. And I still take pride in telling their stories. And, you know, one of the biggest things I've always said for me is that my grandmother died last year, but um, my, I think it was her third great grandmother um, but was named Mildred. Mm -hmm. And my grandmother was named Mildred. And it was the joy in telling her that, you know, this is who she was named after. And this woman was born enslaved. Like for me, that was the best thing because she got to know, she was smiling. She said, I didn't even know that. And just having that one moment, I was just like, ah, oh, this is so great. Yeah. So it's just things like that, yeah. that with the trauma comes the joy and the real resilience that we see in our family. Isn't that true of the African-American experience in general, though? Like with our trauma, with our oppression comes a sense of identity and comes a sense of sort of hope. Um, yes, absolutely. And I think that I, that stems from the generations, right? We've endured so much throughout, we talked a lot today, or people have talked a lot today about their experiences, right? And, and what they've endured in various points in time. And so by us knowing that we have to make a way out of no way, and that things are going to be difficult, um, but we have that already as kind of built in armor. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, you know, we have to have it, but you know, it is the way that it is. Um, but I do think it, it, what makes our experience, you know, different and definitely our experience different in genealogy and our search and where we find our records as well. Yeah. Um, you mentioned something in your answer that I want to um, drill down on a little bit, and it was basically the point that you get to tell people stories. So my question is, how does your background as a lawyer and particularly a Black woman lawyer uh, shape your approach towards genealogy? And are there parallels between lawyering and genealogy where in both practices, you essentially get to tell the suppressed histories of underrepresented people? And I, I want you to speak specifically to women of color um, and, and, and women, uh, enslaved women, um, because I feel like their stories have been um, uh, disproportionately underrepresented when we talk about slave narratives and just what we know about um, what we know about our ancestors. Yeah, so I think the biggest thing um, is, you know, I spent a lot of time in legal documents, right? I didn't expect that to be the case when I was in law school and just starting to do genealogy. But, you know, the records of the enslaved are going to be in courthouses. The records of the enslaved are going to be in these wills. The state papers are talked about, the settlements, the accounts, and all of that. Um, so for me, the legal degree is a, a bonus, a plus, um, because I can cut through the legal ease, as any lawyer knows, right? When you read in the will, it's like the same stuff at the top. You're just like, <laughs> let me find the name. <laughs> let me look for the information I need. Um, cut through all the other stuff and get right to the, you know, kind of the heart of the matter. So that definitely helps. Um, but when it comes to, you know, as a Black woman, as a, you know, a Black woman, a female attorney, um, and, and kind of researching enslaved women, um, you know, the other part about being an attorney is we're taught to remove emotion from a situation. So that has which helped. I disagree with, by the way. <laughs> I think a good I think a good lawyer has a has a good sort of balance of passion or emotion for their client. I I hate when people say you know good lawyering is is emotion removed. I disagree, but anyway, sorry. No, no, I get it, I get it, and it's like you know, but I find myself, and I I, I like you saying that because I think that I have tricked myself for so long thinking that oh I lecture about this, I study this, you know, I can remove emotion from the situation, but I can't because I realize I'm invested in these people, even if they're not related to me. I'm re this is someone's family. I am researching someone. I am trying to tell their story. And that story may be very hard to tell. 
It could be, you know, just difficult. Um, and especially stories of enslaved women because of the trauma that they went through um, just in, in, in a variety of ways, um, you know, as it relates to their own bodies, their children, their families, and all of that. So while I do try, well, I do think sometimes I'm able to remove or better deal with it, um, it does it does become difficult. But I do feel like it's important to do the work to help other people do the work, to help them find their people. And when it comes to enslaved women, I there are a number of books that are written about enslaved women and things that went on. Um, and, you know, they had to really kind of take care of everything. You know, they had to be able to kind of man negotiate the situation, negotiate the situation between the master and the mistress of the house, between their families, between their own, their safety, and, and just try to navigate a lot. And I think that's the story that seems to repeat itself over and over again, no matter whether they were on a very large plantation or they were in a small plantation. It's the navigation of everybody around and trying to protect everything around them in a way that protects themselves. Mm -hmm. And it's so sad. And I'm sure you were on earlier when we did our discussion of Hannah Valentine, but that's exactly what happened, right? So um, she was enslaved to Governor Campbell and um, his wife and also had a very close relationship with uh, their niece. And so she had to manage sort of, you know, their expectations and keep them happy. But she was uh, sort of an enslaved domestic. And so she had a, a husband and children in the Montcalm um, mansion um, and who, who worked there, who she also had to look out for and manage. And then it was so sad to me when I read about her story, because when Governor Campbell got elected to the governorship and had to move to Richmond, you know, she's, she's running around trying to manage and make sure that everybody is happy, that her master and mistress are happy, and that her family is happy. Um, uh, but then something sort of out of her power control happens and her family gets torn apart. And she has to suffer the consequences of that. And it's completely out of her control. She has no agency or no sort of no, no control over the situation. And it's just, it's very sad and, and, and traumatic. And I think that Black women, particularly during slavery, probably suffered some of the most harsh trauma, like you said, particularly because they had to perform these balancing acts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It and as you study the subject, right, and you think about it, um, and you and you find these stories, these stories are they're they're out there, right? They may be hidden. You you kind of realize as you sit, you know, when we were listening to the letter that Hannah wrote, right, and the, the transcription of the letter which she wrote or whatever, um, you you kind of see there are more of those that are out there, but you understand the environment that they were in, and you know, just I think when doing genealogy and researching women, and especially Black women, enslaved women, you have to prepare yourself for kind of the worst, right? For everything. So I'm not gonna, it's not gonna be all unicorns and rainbows, and I may find some stuff that's very troubling, but I need to prepare myself for that because people need to know these stories. They need to understand the balance that they had, um, the, the things they had to do to survive. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's critical in kind of understanding your history as well in American history. Right. Um, so I guess my next question um, will be sort of about the African-American oral tradition. And mm -hmm. I think we have sort of experienced that in our conference today, right? Whether it was Dr. Jerry and his cousin, Dr. Diane, uh, sharing family stories, whether it was Scrapper Brody sort of giving um, his anecdotes and, and, and sharing his stories. Um, so here's the question. Uh, the oral tradition is no doubt a major component of African-American family history, particularly because slaves were prohibited from writing, right? And sort of the first generation of free African-Americans didn't have that skill. So how has the African-American oral tradition either complemented or conflicted with genealogical research when you're sort of looking at the facts and, and documents versus, well, my uncle told me at the family reunion when we were sitting at the table that such and such happened. Right. Um, well, I think with the oral history is very important in African-American genealogy. Um, I, I mean, I think it's important in general, but in African-American genealogy, because that's how the stories were passed down, right? That's how you learn the history. And one of the things on Genealogy Roadshow is that people come to us and say, I heard this. You know, I heard somebody was a horse thief or I heard, you know, I have American Indian or whatever the thing might be. And so what these 
these oral traditions and those stories do, you can use the research to prove or disprove them, right? You may not find everything, as I discussed earlier, um, that proves it to be, you know, right, but at least you'll find some things that will help you um, kind of at least say I have enough circumstantial evidence to, to say that this is a yes or a no, right? Mm -hmm. Because any type of question that you come up with, right? I mean, when you're starting thinking about genealogy research and, and, and principles, it's really what, what is your research question? And that research question can begin with something you heard that was a story that's been passed down and you use the documents to prove or disprove it. But I would not discount what, you know, Uncle George said at the family reunion um, just because Uncle George tends to elaborate, right? There may be some pieces of it that might be true, you know? So well, I somebody think, said Uncle George can stretch the truth. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. But you know what? Just a little bit. But some of what he said might actually be, you know, um, true. So you just take that story, you write it down, and you say, okay, can I prove or disprove this? Yeah, okay, awesome. Um, so what role do you think, Kenyatta, and this is more of a personal question for you, um, just in terms of how, how you approach or, or your view of the discipline. What role does genealogy play in this moment of racial reckoning that we're in, where some, some is me, I am some, are demanding that America acknowledge the role that slavery and racism have played in shaping our country? Where does genealogy fit into this moment? Uh, it fits, it's in the center of it. I mean, and I would just say that just because of how busy I am, right? I mean, you know, it's just the point of genealogy helps us recognize, unearth, discover the past. The documentation is there. The stories are there. I spoke about the narratives from the Freedmen's Bureau, um, the different field offices, um, the reports they did back to Washington, all of that helps us discover that we've come a bit, but we have a, far, we have a long way to go. It helps us understand that the things we're seeing are not new, mm -hmm. that these are things that went on before. I mean, I discussed, I think this week I had a presentation and I discussed sort of I was looking at, I don't know why I decided to do this, but for some reason I was like, oh, I think I'll do a podcast on the murders and outrages in Texas. I don't know why, but I just, <laughs> so I look at the Freedmen's Bureau records and there's a report of that. There's a report. And then the thing that, because they were reporting the climate. And what was so interesting to me is that the person who was victimized, the freedmen, sometimes would go unnamed. Hmm. So we'll just say freedmen. Mm -hmm. So it, it shows you that I think with genealogy, it, especially at the time we're at right now on Juneteenth, it helps you understand the chaos of reconstruction. It helps you understand what happened following emancipation. It also helps you understand that this stuff is not new. A lot of the education around what happens uh, or what happened usually comes from the home, not from schooling, right? It comes from your parents or someone else telling you these stories. So I feel like genealogy can help those folks who may not have their grandparents, who may have folks that don't want to talk about it, for them to be able to discover the story of what happened in their county, mm. you know, what happened in their family, what happened in their state mm -hmm. right after emancipation, and then see how that has trickled down into every aspect of what we're seeing in society today and, and how we how we're seeing people deal with things that are going on. So then my follow-up to that would be, um, as I'm sure you know, we recently marked the 100th anniversary of the massacre and bombing of the Greenwood section of Tulsa, Oklahoma, the so-called Black Wall Street. And so sort of as a follow-up to this, to the question I just asked, how can genealogy sort of shed light on the accumulation or loss of wealth, generational wealth in African-American communities, and even help make individualized cases for reparations? Mm -hmm. Um, great question. As always with yours, lots going on, but I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Kenya. I'm sorry. It's no, a lot okay. going on up here. I'm trying to, I'm I know, trying to I can tell. It's all good. I love it. I love it. Though. <laughs> okay. So let's kind of discuss like, first of all, land, right? I always get emails. I always get things, right? We had land and our land was taken away from us. Okay. We know this happened for some folks through amended domain or other forms, right? Um, so for land information and tracking that, right? You can obviously, when you look in the census records, 1900, 1910s, um, they will have information around owned 
property for you, the mortgage, and then you could try to go find kind of the deed. You could try to figure out and trace the property um, to see where it went, right? The taxes, a lot of times you'll see folks having their property taken away. A husband dies unexpectedly. The wife cannot pay the taxes. It's given, it's, you know, at an auction or something. And now that property is gone, right? Um, the other part of it, I think is, because you said land, and what else is in the question? Sorry, you mentioned reparations as well. Sorry, so yeah, uh, it was a very broad question. Um, yeah. How can genealogy help uh, document the accumulation or loss of generational wealth? And how can it help make an individualized case for reparations for, right. for certain families? Yeah, so the other thing is that I think this is prob probably what you see for, um, as far as reparations are concerned. Um, and what genealogy can do. I think people are really scared that, gene, that you can draw a direct line back to an enslaver. So I could say, hey, you know, did you say your wife's maiden name was Hansberry? Hey, Hand Hansberry fam. Hand. Hand, Hanberry. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I see that in 1860, in, you know, wherever part of the South, you know, you had 30 people that weren't enslaved. You built this wealth on free labor. And I can directly identify my folks to you, I might be coming to you for some reparations. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that genealogy can definitely help in leading that line to it. Um, but I do also feel like that's why it's difficult to do the research because a lot of people don't want us to do that. Um, what's interesting to me is I was at a, um, it was very, I was at a, uh, like a tech thing, because I was in tech before I ended up, um, before I left to do genealogy full-time, and I was a tech event, and I told this gentleman, I was asking a question or something, and he said, oh, well, what's your business? And I said, oh, well, I'm trying to help make it easier for African Americans to find their enslaved ancestors, and he says, oh, is that for reparations? And it was a very odd question to me. <laughs> Because that wasn't what I was thinking. <laughs> but I do feel like that's what people are thinking, right? They're like, well, if they, if they trace it back and they know, because I know my family may be nefarious or maybe I don't even know, but someone knocks on my door and says, hey, you know, when we built this plantation, you're living on, you know, I want my reparations or whatever. I think that may be something difficult. So I feel like genealogy can be that bridge. But as we see these different committees and things come up around reparations, genealogy is definitely going to play a part in that, right? Because people are going to want to start proving or have you prove that your ancestors were enslaved. Mm -hmm. I think you're absolutely right. I think it is uh, potentially scary for some local governments and some opponents of reparations that genealogy is a tool that will be able to provide African Americans with sort of an objective proof, not just like a narrative or something like that, to show not only were they connected to certain people um, who profited from the free labor of enslaved persons, but also, as you mentioned, and I think you use some property records and some other sorts of land records, um, and I'm just thinking of the, the uh, Black Wall Street Greenwood section of Tulsa, Oklahoma, right? If, if the deeds and all, you know, sort of the land records show that your, you know, great, great grandfather owned a barbershop or a confectionery on that street. And, you know, you can sort of show that the, um, that the building was bombed or that he suffered some sort of financial loss and you can prove your lineage to him. Um, you know, that, that's a problem. <laughs> um, yeah. Be, it, yeah. It is. And the thing about it also, you can use city directories, right. To show, uh, the, as to support that property stuff, but also, I mean, you know, you have to, the other part is specifically around these massacres and things like Tulsa is covering up the damage and wanting to not really, how do you explain to your great grandchild that you just, you know, you were part of something like that, mm -hmm. right? Um, or, or even if you find it out in your family. Um, and I'm not saying obviously the folks that were victims, but the folks that, you know, that were the aggressors in mm -hmm. that situation. And so what this does in doing genealogy, and this becomes a thing that I think we find happens with DNA, is it forces you to have a conversation. And you have to have a conversation about something difficult, mm -hmm. that my ancestor was part of, you know, an event that destroyed people's lives. Mm -hmm. And that I, my ancestor was the victim of that event. 
Mm -hmm. And how do we reconcile? And how do we talk to each other? And genealogy forces you to kind of come together and have those conversations. Yeah, I agree. So I want to talk a little bit about um, sort of filling in the gaps, right? And placing things in context, which I think genealogy can sometimes be good for based on sort of the anecdotes that I heard um, on the Genealogy Roadshow. And also just questions that were prompted during my sort of sitting in on today's conference, right? So the question is, how does genealogy and uncovering family ties help fill in the gaps or provide motive or place in context the black and white written history. And so I'm thinking of a couple examples. If you recall, Finn Castle Starrett and William King, um, how William King, this millionaire from the salt mines, granted this uh, enslaved person the ability to sort of manage and negotiate his business affairs. And I wonder whether there might have been something going on in the background there. And another example we've heard of today is Landon Boyd and Governor Wyndham Robertson, and how um, there may be some sort of relationship with Governor Robertson being Landon Boyd's son through his enslaved mistress, and maybe that sort of explains um, Boyd's sort of political ambition. So how can genealogy sort of help fill in the gaps and explain motives and, and things like that? Yeah, so the documents, I mean, the documents are the documents, right? So as you're doing the research, the documents can tell a story, but a lot of times you have to use other evidence to kind of get behind that motive, right? So for example, um, I think genealogy, you know, I showed the example with um, George Dewelly earlier in my presentation and how he named who his father was. I might not have known that had he not had that narrative published about him, right? So I think genealogy, when you have the opportunity or you find the documents, they can tell you kind of the, the full story, but there's other things that kind of go on in helping you understand the relationship. You have to look at the climate at that time. You have to also analyze the household. So what I mean by that in looking at, you know, George, Mary, um, and Caleb or CJ Cook, that was a household of its own. There were no other people in that household but the three of them. What does that mean? What does that say? What does that imply, mm -hmm. right? I don't know for sure, but I can kind of figure out what's going on there based mm -hmm. on my research. So I feel like genealogy, when you're given that information like that, can help you kind of say, okay, well, maybe this was a relationship. They couldn't get married, and this is what mm -hmm. happened. I mean, that And another be example... Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Sure. Another example I'm thinking of is, um, and it was the episode of Genealogy Rocho I watched, it was um, the, the individual who had Native American ancestry who brought his walking stick and asked one of your colleagues to essentially like, you know, tell me if this walking stick belonged to my Native American ancestor. And they pulled up um, sort of like a census record or something. And the Native American ancestor, all the people in her household were listed as W. But for her race, it, it was a really weird sort of marking. And it almost looked like somebody had written I-N, but then came back and written a W. And your colleagues sort of speculated, you know, maybe something that this document tells us is that what was going on at the time was it would have been very weird and sort of prompted questions from people why this, you know, woman who is of an Indian race is the head of household for these white children. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. And so those types of things, that's a great example of looking at the document and analyzing it more, right? I talked earlier about genealogy, genealogy is not just about date or dates, names, and places. It's about looking at that census record, looking for the different things that might have been crossed out, analyzing the household, the neighbors, and the things around you to kind of give you that, to tell that full story. That's why I always say you have to know the county that you're researching in, in and out. You have to know the laws in and out to give you that full story. So I feel like genealogy um, can provide you with um, a picture, kind of a, you know, a, a snapshot, let's say, in time and help you with some additional evidence to say, okay, I think this is what was going on, mm -hmm. or I can prove this story or anything like that. Um, but yeah, anytime you analyze a document, you have to really look at everything on that page, on that census record, on that deed, in that will, because it all tells a, a bigger story. And especially if you're doing any research in legal documents, the witnesses, the administrators, any of those folks, they all tie together. And you'll find these communities are kind of just, they're all very, they're very tight. 
depending on where you're researching, but definitely in rural areas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, so my last written question for you, um, and this is just sort of to sum up um, everything that we've done here, which I hope has provided our, our participants and audience um, a sense of reconnection with the Southwest Virginia area. I, I think I mentioned this earlier today, I am new to Southwest Virginia. I'm here for a clerkship. And I, let's, let's use the word apprehensive, um, was apprehensive about coming to the Southwest Virginia area just because um, I didn't know much about it uh, or its diversity or lack thereof. Um, and, but since working with the Historical Society, I've actually been pleasantly surprised with the rich history of formerly enslaved African Americans and prominent African Americans who I've learned have come from Washington County. And I wonder if other people could maybe benefit from, um, you know, doing some research and maybe tra tracing their roots to this area. So the question is, how can genealogy connect people with parts of the country like Southwest Virginia, where some people might not know that they have roots and aren't even known for being that diverse? Right. Um, well, one thing with genealogy, right, you typically, as I said, start or, uh, start with yourself and work backwards. And then you get kind of to that 1870 uh, brick wall or whatever. But what you can do is when you have an ancestor, I say all roads lead to Virginia. So maybe if your ancestor was sold down the river to Mississippi, you find them. And at some point in a census record, maybe in 1880 or 1900, they say that their family member or their mother or father was from Virginia, right? You need to follow that, that lead, right? Because we know that, especially through Virginia, when you had the coffles that were coming through, people were coming from various areas. So even though they may have ended up in Tennessee, they may have ended up in Mississippi, they could be from Southwest Virginia. So I'd highly encourage anyone who do, who's listening today, who watches this recording, who doesn't really know if they have a connection, to actually follow any leads they see within census records or death records um, that mention this area, but that's true for any area that you're researching. Also, conferences like this are extremely helpful in getting to know more about the area, getting to know more about Washington County and Southwest Virginia, and also the county histories. I know we've mentioned a couple books um, that are helpful. So it's not just genealogy as a whole, it's using the principles of genealogical research in addition to history that'll help you find your connections to an area you may not have thought of before. Mm -hmm. um, and I've seen that in my own family, um, not only in Virginia, we kind of knew our Virginia roots, but in Georgia, as well as in Arkansas. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you today, Kingada. I hope that my questions did not drag you in too many different directions at no, one time. But yeah, it was, it was great learning from you all throughout the conference, and I, I really appreciate your thoughts and contributions today. I think at this point, um, we'd like to open it up to the audience and see if um, there are any questions that they have that they'd like to ask you. I don't think I see any questions. Let's see. May I speak? <laughs> it's easier than typing. Yes. Sure, go ahead. What do you do? Uh, how do you jump over the 1900 census wall? Uh, you talk about a wall. There's a wall. Okay, so you're talking about the 20 year gap between 1880 and 1900. Right. Um, yeah, so, okay, a couple of things with that. Um, one would be newspapers. Um, depending on an area, are you talking a rural area or a big city area or? Well, I mean, just in general, I have family in North Carolina, Louisiana, and the, the uh, Virginia areas. And typically, Black folks weren't being written about newspapers, you know, in 1900, so. Typically, yeah, they weren't, but there is a book, um, there are books that have been published on Black newspapers, um, but they also might be listed in um, a city directory. Um, yeah. I have found that for my family um, in, I believe it's Macon, I was looking at, or either, it was either that or Alabama, but I have seen my family in uh, city directories as well. So that's another way. Um, between that time period, I would also um, try to see, it, uh, county histories actually may not list, um, you may not think that they list Black folks, but they do. I know the county history for uh, Culpepper does mention my third great-grandfather and his contributions to the church that was started like 
during that time period before he went to upstate New York. So I would look for documents like that. Another great resource for you um, is, I like to do this, I don't know if everyone <laughs> would wanna do it, is I like dissertations. Um, dissertations and master's theses are, are great because people will take an area and a subject and they will just focus on it. And a lot of times you, you will find that they focus on the African-American community in the area that you're researching. And don't forget to look at the special collections because some things might've been donated to universities as well. So those are things that I've used personally to get to deal with that um, 20 year gap. Thank you. You're welcome. There's also a question that's been presented uh, someone is the great uh, granddaughter of Daniel Trigg Edinburgh, who is one of the names in our uh, Washcoba family tree. She says he was a dining servant for Senator John Johnson in Virginia. And there was some reference uh, to uh, the idea that he was with Robert E. Lee at some point. So she's, she's asking how to find Senator John Johnson's will and other information about someone like that who, who uh, uh, was a public figure, but you know, maybe not a, a, a real well-known one. How do you find records like that? Um, so if he was in Virginia, I would go to the, my first thing would be the Library of Virginia. Um, they have a great collection. So I would see the type of records they might have, um, any type of government uh, records related to uh, what was going on at the time that he was a Senator. Um, so Library of Virginia, um, there's something called Archive Grid that you can actually search and you can find where there are papers for certain people. So usually some folks have family papers and those could be at various um, historical societies and libraries around the country. Um, so that's what I would look at. Also, he had to be mentioned in newspapers. Um, so I would look for newspapers that might talk about his term, what he did, anything about anyone associated with him. Um, so those would be kind of the, the, my top three or four things I would do. She also asks, she also asks about Tuskegee Veterans Hospital. Apparently there's an issue trying to get records from them. Do you know anything about that? Yes. Okay. So I don't, I'm not familiar with them specifically, but in general, um, trying to get hospital records, medical records are going to be very, very difficult. Um, you need to understand the laws of the state that you're looking um, at. Also, if there's any type of archive of those records, um, it just, I know actually someone has, is actually going to court to get a record, a medical record for someone that's been deceased um, for more than, I think, 75 plus years, right? So medical records are going to be very difficult. Um, but I would suggest also, if you need to, probably hire a genealogist in Alabama um, that might be able to help you and may have gone through that issue before. Uh, someone, someone, asked, someone asked you to pull out your crystal ball and say what you, whether you think it is realistic to expect reparations. Uh, no, because... <laughs> I'm just going to say, you know, my mom said they've been talking about this forever. Okay. So um, I don't, and here's why. Um, and I'm not being joking about it at all. I mean, I just think it's because it's a very difficult number and it's a, it's a very difficult number to, I think, calculate, but everyone knows the number is very large. I feel as though we, although we are, you know, Juneteenth is a holiday now, we're not there yet. We're, we're able to actually kind of feel like, I think, as a, as a whole country, that reparations is something that we need to do. Um, that's just my opinion. We've tried for a while. There have been books written about it. Will it come in some forms? I think there will be some form, but maybe little pieces of it, but it will continue to be a fight. As we talked about during just this Q&A or during a conversation, if we can draw a direct line to insurance companies, to banks, I mean, we can look at banks that actually were started just for slavery to, you know, finance buying slaves that are now part of Chase or, or J.P. Morgan Chase or part of whomever, then you have that direct line back to them. 
for them to say, we're going to say, okay, well, now we're going to give you, I don't know, $100,000, $5,000, I think will be difficult. And it, it's also an issue that a lot of people do not agree on. Um, and so that's why I feel like it's going to be a very difficult one for us to actually achieve. So Kenyatta, I, uh, I agree. Oh, no. Okay. Sorry. We were having some feedback. Um, I am likewise skeptical that we will see uh, reparations, um, at least in the traditional form that we've always thought about it, which are cash payments, um, at least during our lifetime. But I would, in a kernel of optimism, um, maybe suggest to you and some other folks on the um, on the on the conference today that we should sort of rethink what a reparations package would look like uh, and sort of get outside this framework of just straight cash payments. First, because I agree, it's sort of difficult and real, I think impossible to really measure the money damages that folks would have suffered having family split apart, generational wealth taken. I don't know how you put a number on that to begin with. Um, yeah. But secondly, and I think you mentioned a great example, right? To the extent that companies, banks, institutions, um, colleges, uh, benefited from slave labor, um, maybe on an institution basis, those um, sort of groups or organizations could reach out to the descendants of folks who they took advantage of in slavery. I think about my, um, my law school, Georgetown, um, sold 272 slaves in order to finance itself and ensure that it could sort of maintain and stay afloat. Uh, it, was, it was at risk of going bankrupt. And so in order to sort of make amends for that, Georgetown has created the 272 project or something to that effect where they are giving um, basically admissions uh, benefits to students who can prove their direct lineage to one of the 272 um, and also providing a tuition stipend. I also think about banks and companies, right? Um, this is a radical idea maybe, but to the extent that uh, a bank or a publicly traded company benefited from slave labor, giving out stock options or some sort of ownership um, even if small, to some of those families who were um, sort of taken advantage of during slavery, I think would be a huge sort of step forward. And I also think that we are seeing a move for direct cash payments, um, even on a town or county level, right? Uh, there, there would be nothing um, preventing a town or a county from passing legislation, uh, Washington County, for example, to provide direct payments to folks who can show that their ancestors were enslaved here in Washington County and the value of their labor was, uh, was taken away and deprived. Um, right. So I think we should just sort of maybe um, rethink about how we conceptualize reparations and also maybe um, be willing to discuss more incremental forms of reparations, whether it's from the private industries or even from towns and counties, rather than like one check from the federal government. Uh, yeah, I do. And someone made a comment, uh, be nice if reparations was in the form of education, right? Which is excellent. I, you know, this is why, you know, we look at this the, the entire day and all the stories and we think about genealogy. This is how genealogy ties into everything and helps in telling these stories and talking about it get, gets us to think differently about maybe reparations, gets us to talk to each other and think ways about kind of coming to terms with things that happened, including, you know, both uh, how institutions were involved, uh, higher education institutions, how counties, towns, and everyone was really involved in kind of this, this thing called slavery that we're studying to find our ancestors. So continuing to learn, to research, to discuss can help us get to the point of where you're optimistic and where we can find new ways, I think. And that was actually my mom who asked the question. So shout out to my mom, <laughs> y'all. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Awesome. Kenyatta, as you know, I'm, I'm from Oklahoma. And so the Tulsa situation is something that has had my attention a little bit. And both you and Elijah know from a legal point of view, one of the issues is a statute of limitations. There were attempts in 1921, 22, um, by John Hope Franklin's father, who was an attorney in uh, Greenwood, and other attorneys to file suit for reparations, and the courts would not entertain them. One of the issues there is the fact that the town deputized, Tulsa deputized some of the whites who went into Greenwood to uh, destroy it. So with, with that, you can make the argument that uh, the, the government was 
endorsing and supporting it and they were agents of the government so therefore the government should make restitution another point is the fact that there are three individuals over 100 years of age who are still alive and they suffered from the massacre directly because their families were impacted um, but certainly one of the issues that a court would look at is the statute of limitations. If you wanted to bring a claim for restitution or for an insurance claim, you should have done so a long time ago or your, your ancestors should have done so a long time ago. Any comments about that? From either well, I mean, I think that's kind of from, I'll, I'll just jump in real quick. I just think it's a catch 22, right? You should have brought it a long time ago, but you weren't going to listen to us, right? We tried and we didn't get the opportunity. So it's sort of that, it's that thing that goes into, um, you know, you want restitution, you want to fix the situation, but if the system itself is not allowing you to do that or saying you should have did it before, then where do you stand? And I think that's why you have the bigger discussion mm -hmm. around it because all of these different massacres in Lane, Arkansas, I mean, we could talk about uh, this red summer of 1919, like all of these different things that happened, uh, you know, they happened over a hundred years ago, but we had no recourse. We did we were not, as you say, were entertained with even trying to bring those things to court. So this is why the broader reparations discussion I think is happening because it's like, yeah, with statute of limitations, but you wouldn't hear me back in the day. Mm -hmm. Even today, you don't even hear me. I don't know. That's just my thought on it. I don't know. Um, yes. So, Walt, I'd like to respond. Um, and so I know uh, you, I, and Ken Yada are all lawyers, so I will try to keep this as, as lay as possible for our non-legal um, audience. But I think um, Tulsa presents a really interesting example. Well, I don't know if you've heard, I read in the New York Times, that there's a group who's bringing a claim under Section 1983, specifically because, as you mentioned, the people who got into airplanes and bombed and uh, murdered and set afire the buildings in Tulsa had been deputized by sheriffs and other law enforcement. And what this statute that I referred to called Section 1983 allows is for private individuals to bring lawsuits against people acting under color of state law for constitutional deprivations, such as uh, the deprivation of, of property without due process of law. There is no statute of limitations on a constitutional violation or on a Section 1983 claim, as far as I understand. So I think Tulsa might um, sort of provide a good opportunity to sort of keep track on what's going on over there and whether they are able to be successful um, with a 1983 claim um, to sort of pursue reparations. And I think we should just generally, as, as well as rethinking or reconceptualizing what reparations looks like, I think we should also reconceptualize um, or sort of be more um, creative with our mechanisms or remedies to seek it, whether it be through, you know, certain, certain causes of action, certain lawsuits, certain statutes. So I, I think we should keep an eye on the, on the lawsuit in Tulsa under the Section 1983 claim. And I think a lot of that, I think a lot of that may limit the recovery because that would be against the government for the obvious reasons you just stated and not against insurance carriers, not against individuals or descendants of individuals. It's very interesting if you go to Tulsa on Google Maps and go on Haskell Street in Greenwood, you can still see the sidewalks. You can still see the steps leading up from the sidewalks. You can still see the driveways that date back to 1921, and there's no house on top of the hill. Mm. Wow. That's great. I don't think we, we have, have a couple any... more questions. Oh, good. Uh, Michael Hyder says, I've recently discovered that my family owned slaves in Washington County. Can you suggest things that I might do to recognize this while honoring their lives and families? Maybe help someone find an ancestor. Um, well, if you have documentation that identifies the enslaved individuals by name, obviously, uh, you know, giving to the historical society and allowing them to put that information on their website. You can also see if you want to, you can start a tree and try to trace them forward to, you know, find the descendants. Um, and definitely if you do that, 
um, you know, I would uh, approach them maybe and say, I've done this research, I found this document and see what they say. There's not a place, um, there's not a general website, for example, because you're doing Washington County, you can go to the Historical Society, but for other folks listening, if they have different places where they know their family enslaved individuals, there's not necessarily one site where you can just kind of post this information. Um, it's typically good for you to do the historical societies, genealogical societies, archives, and then a lot of times just sharing the story, you know, just sharing a story there. You know, if you want to write a little piece about it, a post or something like that. Um, I mean, I know people use Facebook, some don't. I post it in the Facebook group. There are just a lot of different ways where you can share that information across uh, multiple areas. And that's what, what I would suggest. But if you really want to get involved, take that documentation you have and trace those folks forward to find their descendants. And actually, actually our Washtova family tree could be helpful to yes. white people in Washington County to locate descendants of people who were enslaved simply by using the cohabitation register. If you know that John Smith was your white ancestor and you can see from the either the slave census of 1860, 1850, as well as the cohabitation list, who some of the people were that were enslaved by your family, you can then use our Washkova family tree to find out who some of the descendants were of some of those slaves. There's an, there is another question. Um, when an ancestor is moved from one cemetery to another, how can you find them? Hmm. Um, so I have had luck. Well, a couple, couple things. So if they're moved from one cemetery to another, um, I have had luck with family search. Um, with their records that are not indexed. So I've had luck with finding old cemetery records. For example, a lot of my folks in Macon were buried in the colored cemetery. Um, so I've been able to find information. And in that information, it said whether they've been moved or not. So if it was colored cemetery to Porterdale or whatever the cemetery was, I've had luck with that. Um, but I would definitely, uh, and cemeteries change names as well. So if you, you know, you have a find a grave, you have a billion graves, that's just really, those are kind of like crowdsourced type of um, information. But I would try family search, looking at their collections they have on cemeteries. Um, I mean, that's just been where I've, where I've seen it be helpful. Um, but also, yeah, maybe even, I would also want to know why they were moved, like what prompted that move? Right? Was there a reason for them to move from Cemetery A to Cemetery B? Was it because there wasn't, you know, they wanted to be buried near a family member? There, there has to be some type of documentation um, for that. And yeah, I would, I would definitely do family search. Here in Washington, here in Washington County, we have a book called High on a Windy Hill, and uh, there are follow-ups to it, and it was very tedious. Um, volunteer work to put together a list of all of the known cemeteries in Washington County and the names of the people known to be buried there. Several of the entries there were the old colored cemeteries, the black cemeteries. Um, and so a resource like that is a good starting point. One of the PDFs that we're going to be providing to everyone is a PDF listing the names of the historically African-American cemeteries and directions on how to get there. Yep, that's great. And Diane just typed in, a court has to approve a grave being moved. So then there's additional documentation for that. But I don't know when that started. There may be a, a cemetery from 100 or 150 years ago. We, we don't know where Finn Castle Sterrett is buried. And we mm -hmm. don't know where a number of historic figures in Washington County's African-American history are buried. They're probably in the 
colored section of the Sinking Spring Cemetery. Um, most of those headstones are gone. That was a cemetery that was not tended to very well for many decades, as, as you can imagine. Uh, that's where Landon Boyd is buried, um, but we don't know if his wife is, is buried there, for example. Um, and there's not a register of people who were buried at the, at the African-American cemetery. Those are some of the things that make it difficult. Mm -hmm. And there was a comment that the person was, was moved because of a highway being put in back in the 1940s. So that's when I, that person was moved or their gravesite was moved. A lot of times we see, I mean, and the other thing, and I know we're, it's been a long day and we're at the end of the day. Um, but a lot of things that we see when you hear about these, you know, enslaved cemeteries that they find when they're doing, you know, some type of construction or something like that. Um, you know, some folks may not, you may not be able to find everyone and may not know where everyone is because there has been, you know, a disregard for the burial grounds of these individuals, right? Um, as if it, no documentation or they're, you know, they don't really care. So I really feel like, um, you know, it's, it's like finding a needle in a haystack, but still, if you understand, if it's in the 1940s and, you know, it was because of a highway, there should be, I would think, some type of record. Like it was mentioned, uh, there needs to be a court record, so look for that. Um, so I would just say my closing comments for me, just take everything that you've learned today about the local history and about genealogy and use that to create the broader story. Um, about your ancestor and definitely make sure you participate and add to or take advantage of the ancestry, uh, the tree that was created, because a lot of work has gone into that over the past couple of years. And I've seen the team do a lot of work on that. So thank you so much for having me. You know, it's early on my end, late on your end. So. Yeah, it's only 2.23 your time. So we yes, really feel is. sorry for you. You'll have the rest of the day. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Kenyatta, again, thank you for uh, your presentation today, as, as well as the many, literally many hours you have put in uh, listening to me and the other uh, planning team for this conference, uh, pretty close to almost probably about two years or more uh, that you've participated. So uh, it, it is certainly appreciated.